G'day everyone, and welcome to Lubrication Explained. In this video, we're going to be talking about metal deactivator additives and what they do for lubricants. So the first question would be, why do we need metal deactivators? The problem with metals um, is that they can have a bit of a catalytic effect on both oxidation and corrosion. So um, if you had, for example, a new a copper cooler in an engine and you get some copper migrating into the lubricant probably in ionic form each of those ions can act as kind of a, a site that promotes further oxidation and therefore the aging process of the oil so it can accelerate the breakdown of the base oil the other thing that can happen is that if you get corrosive byproducts they can increase the acidity of the oil um, and cause further corrosion so what we ideally want is some kind of protective barrier to form between new metals and the lubricant itself. Um, as that barrier wears away, you want to have sufficient additives within the lubricant that it can reform as well. Now that barrier, we ideally need it to be inert or inactive. So it needs to bind to the metal surface, uh, surface and then not chemically react with anything else. So what this requires is some kind of surface active molecule that's attracted to the metal surface. So how do we achieve that? Well, deactivators work much like a lot of other additives in that they have two components to them. One is a polar head, and then you've got a non-polar tail. So the polar head will be attracted to metallic surfaces. The non-polar tail will be attracted to the lubricant and make it soluble in the lubricant. Um, but it's the polar head which is attracting it to the middle surface. So here's the mechanism. You might have seen something like this before. But imagine that there's a boundary between the metal and the lubricant. In this case, we're showing copper. So we've got copper atoms on one side, and then you've got the lubricant, and I'm showing the metal deactivator additives on the other side. So what's going to happen is that when the copper is new, there's going to be a bit of a, an ionic exchange. So some of the copper atoms are going to end up in the lubricant and they'll disperse through the lubricant as well. But at the same time, the metal deactivator additives are trying to bind with the surface and minimize the uh, contact surface area between the metal and the lubricant. And what that does is it slows down that sort of passivation process. So as we were to cycle through, you get more copper at um, atoms or ions in solution and eventually what you end up with is a, a surface that is fully inert. And we would say that the, the surface has now been passivated. That is to say, it's not an active exchange anymore. Now, one thing you'll notice is that the surface area decreased with time. So if you like, the rate of change also decreases. One thing that you'll notice is that all of these ions in here, they can also be oxidation catalysts. So we want to minimize the amount in which which means that we want that um, deactivation process or passivation process to occur as fast as possible. Now, as I mentioned, the rate of exchange of ions with the lubricant uh, decreases. So what that is is a sort of a deceleration pattern. And the way that you would recognize that in oil analysis is you'd see a curve that looks logarithmic in nature. The reason I say that is because the opposite if it were exponential, uh, would be a little bit more akin to wear metals, right? So if you see copper that it has exponential growth, that's likely to be wear, whereas logarithmic growth is likely to be passivation. And that's because in wear, um, wear metals beget more wear metals. So if you have a, let's say, a, a, a copper wear particle that's, you know, uh, floating through the system, it's likely to induce more wear and so one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, etc. Passivation, of course, the, the, slow, the process slows down. And eventually, once the barrier becomes completely inactive, it should actually completely stop. The other thing about metal deactivators is that they are a surface acting additive, which means that they have to compete with other surface acting additives. So as an example, we've got zinc dialkyl dithiophosphate or ZDDP very common additive um, that is used in, in many industrial uh, and passenger vehicle lubricants. Now that is also a surface acting additive. 
So you, if you remember, um, what it does is it forms a protective barrier on surfaces, notably uh, the cam surfaces and the cam lobes, because they uh, kind of have higher rates of wear, if you like, because they're under uh, more load than other parts of the engine. And they form this inert barrier where it's this kind of zinc phosphate glass. Well, uh, you know, in order to bind with the metal surfaces, the ZDDP molecule has to be, to a certain degree, polar as well. And so our metal deactivator additives are going to be competing with something like ZDDP or even EP additives for uh, those metal surface areas. So when formulators are designing lubricants, they have to ensure that the metal deactivator and other surface acting additives um, are not going to uh, compete, outcompete each other uh, for specific surfaces. So they have to tailor the additives so that, for example, uh, one will uh, be attracted to copper, another one will be attracted to aluminium, another will be attracted to uh, iron or steel. Then you've also got different processes by which uh, the, met the deactivators are attracted to the surfaces. So the first is adhesion. Uh, that's, you know, the process of attachment of a substance to the surface of another substance. And we distinguish that from uh, any of the other types because this one kind of requires some kind of energy input. Now that can come from chemical or physical linkages, but you basically need, maybe it's uh, temperature or pressure or something to, to cause that adhesion. And eventually that builds the passivation layer. Then you've got conversion, which is where the additives want to actually react with the metal surface and deposit a protective film. So two slightly different processes to achieve the same result. Now, why it's different, why it's uh, uh, necessary to distinguish between the two of these is because they act in different ways and in different circumstances. So at very low temperatures, what you want is something that adheres to the surface, right? So with a little bit of energy, you can get that adhesion. At the mid-range temperatures, what you want is something that converts, so it uses a chemical interaction between the additive and the metal surface. But those conversion additives, they usually break down at high temperatures. Um, and they actually, particularly the uh, conversion uh, products that have sulfur and phosphorus in them, they break down into acidic byproducts, which are undesirable in, in the oil because they can raise uh, the corrosive potential. So at high temperatures, you need to go back and use um, additives uh, that bond by adhesion. Now, what's the takeaway for us as, as operators is that we have to be very careful that we use a lubricant which is uh, designed for the service uh, that we have. So, for example, you can't take a lubricant with mid-range conversion acting metal deactivators and then use them in a much higher temperature application because you will get a breakdown of those additives. So this is one of those things I like to talk about because it shows that lubricant formulations are a little bit more complex than maybe we give them credit for. So I hope that this has been a helpful explanation of metal deactivators and what they do. Uh, this has been Lubrication Explained.